tonight. Good evening, everybody, and thank you all for coming down tonight. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida, so a message for our internet audience watching at home. If at any time during the presentation you'd like to purchase a copy of tonight's book, just call the number on your screen. We'll take care of that for you. We will get it signed, and we will have it shipped to you wherever you are in the United States free of charge. This evening, Books and Books is very happy to welcome back Dr. William Rothman, presenting his new book, Must We Kill the Thing We Love? Emersonian Perfectionism and the Films of Alfred Hitchcock. This uh, event is being presented in collaboration with the Center for the Humanities at the University of Miami. And uh, right now, please welcome to the microphone the director of the center, Professor Miyoko Suzuki. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to present our first book talk of the academic year. We'll be having seven book talks this academic year, approximately one a month, once a month. And all of the book talks will be live streamed. So if you can't make it to Books and Books, please watch us on your computer. Uh, we also have three Stanford professors, one of whom is Rita Duff, and she'll be visiting uh, the UM campus in February and notices will be going out, uh, going out before the event, and Books and Books will also be coming to sell her books there, so please come and join us in February. Next week, we have our first Stanford professor, Robert Proctor, uh, prof uh, professor of history of science at Stanford University, and he, he has been serving as an expert witness at many uh, tobacco trials throughout the state in Florida. And actually, I just got an email from him today that he's in Fort Myers right now uh, testifying. And last week, he was at the Miami-Dade Courthouse. So I think he'll be a very uh, interesting, insightful um, uh, discussant of the current situation uh, with, with the tobacco industry. And he'll be speaking on the origins of the cigarette catastrophe and the case for abolition at um, the College of Arts and Sciences Gallery at Wesley Center on the University of Miami campus next Thursday at 7 p.m. So please join us. Uh, tonight, uh, I have the pleasure of um, introducing Dr. Gregory Shepard, who is the Dean of Communi the School of Communication, and he will be uh, introducing our distinguished speaker tonight. Thank you. Uh, an introduction of the introducer. Um, many years ago, I was a faculty member at the University of Kansas, um, where I was fortunate to have as a colleague a man named Will Lynn Kugel. I don't, has anybody heard that name, Lynn Kugel? He was, uh, he was a rhetorical studies scholar, and he was really the guy who kind of, in, in rhetoric, invented genre criticism. And genre criticism subsequently sort of took off and people, you know, made up genre, thousands of genres of, of speeches. And I know, as I, he would tell me, as I was sort of preparing this introduction, he would say, Greg, these introductions and these occasions, they're a rhetorical genre. There are certain things you have to accomplish in an introduction. The first of those things, my mind the least important, but Will would have said, you've got to do this, Greg, is you have to credential the speaker. This is not hard in Bill's case. Um, and many of you may know his biography because he's a well-known scholar. Um, he graduated from Harvard College in 1965, uh, magna cum laude, in philosophy. And he hung around Harvard for a while to get his PhD in philosophy in 1974, um, where he was perhaps the first real sort of philosophically trained scholar of film. He has published numerous books, the, the most famous of which, and I suspect many of you know this, is Hitchcock, The Murderous Gaze. Um, Forty-some essays and articles, and I will say many of which have been very influential uh, in the field of uh, film criticism and theory in part because um, Bill was a bit of a contrarian um, in, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, very sympathetic to my own views, in fact, as we'll get into in a little bit. Um, but uh, Bill comes from a tradition that I want to sort of embrace him as an American pragmatist. Um, and that ran him counter in some ways to the continental um, theorists that were ruling the day in, in film theory and criticism. Um, 
So now some of those essays have really become canonical in, in film criticism. So um, I've credentialed Professor Rothman enough. Let me just talk for a second about the book that you're going to hear about tonight. Um, this, is, this is what you get when, when a brilliant philosopher falls in love with the movies. It's a very special work. So as I'm, as I'm diving into it, um, as, is, as is too easy a kind of temptation, you, you start to see yourself and your own interests in the works of people that you like and admire. So I'm reading this and I'm seeing me and my stuff and interests in here all over the place, which sends me scurrying to my bookshelf and pulling things off. And I go and I, I, I pull out Anthony Giddens' Central Problems in Social Theory, and I think his critique of Althusser's structuralism Bill, fits right with Bill's ideas. And I go maybe a bridge too far and pull Rorty's Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity off the shelf, because I think his views on literary criticism match well to what Bill's doing in this book. And I start to write a, a, a lecture as an introduction. And I will tell you, you are all saved by Will Linkugel, whose voice came in my head and said, remember, an introduction is a genre. It's not your job to give the lecture. So I didn't come in with all these books. I came in with this one terrific book. And let me, let me read one little passage for you that suggests the power that comes with a philosopher who's examining film. I love much that's in here, Bill, but this just really took me. Professor Rothman writes, the more we clutch at films, the more we fetishize theories that purport to tell us a priori what films are and are not capable of expressing, the more they will slip through our fingers. The alternative is to receive films, to read them moment by moment, trusting to our experience to reveal the thoughts they are expressing in their indirect way. Thoughts that are inseparable from the moods the camera captures and the moods those moods cast. Inseparable from the ways their flux of moods moves us to take thought. And inseparable from the ways the films introduce us into the reality. The reality that baffles the intellect the reality that we are and are not alone, the reality that we inhabit a world or worlds in which there are other selves whose nature is no different from our own. Bill reads film as a philosopher, and so he teaches us ontology in doing so, what it means to be in this world. I couldn't be more proud to be here tonight. Thanks, Bill, for asking me to do this. Bill Rothman. He chose a good passage. <laughs> uh, I'm going to uh, read two passages from the book. The first from the introduction, and the second uh, it's about the film Notorious, and it's talking about a sequence that happened to be the first sequence that I ever wrote about, and it became part of writing about that became part of my uh, doctoral dissertation in philosophy at Harvard. So it, it has special meaning to me. Unfortunately, neither of these passages have any funny jokes in them, so they're not completely characteristic of the whole book. So, okay, for, and well, fortunately, I like to read my own writing out loud, and even more, I love to read passages from Emerson out loud. Uh, so, here I go, if everything works. Hitchcock loved to quote Oscar Wilde's line, each man kills the thing he loves. But he was equally drawn to the moral outlook that the philosopher Stanley Cavell calls Emersonian perfectionism, which was in the ascendancy in Hollywood as it was in America during the New Deal years. The tension between these incompatible worldviews, must we kill the thing we love, argues, 
was the driving force of Hitchcock's work. The book discovers a dialectical progression from Hitchcock's British thrillers to his earliest American films, made when the Emersonian outlook was beginning to suffer repression in Hollywood, to his wartime films, to his films of the late 1940s, to his masterpieces of the 1950s, to Psycho, to The Birds, and ultimately to Marnie, his most controversial film, in which Hitchcock transcended the murderous aspect of his art, overcame his ambivalence, and fully embraced the Emersonian worldview he had always also resisted. For Hitchcock personally, though, this proved a Pyrrhic victory. Marnie's critical and commercial failure was a catastrophe from which his career never fully recovered. My book backs up the central claim about the central, the overall trajectory of Hitchcock's career with close readings of individual films that explore previously unsuspected regions of meaning within them. The introduction and concluding chapter make the further case that Hitchcock and Emerson as authors have surprising affinities. Consider, for example, this oft-quoted sentence from Emerson's S. great essay experience, quote, life is a train of moods like a string, a string of beads, and as we pass through them, they prove to be many colored lenses which paint the world their own hue, and each shows only what lies in its focus. Insofar as films express themselves by their successions of moods, moods they capture, moods those moods cast over us, a film is a train of moods too. When Emerson observes that our, quote, flux of moods only plays about the surface and never introduces us into the reality, contact with which we would even pay the costly price of sons and lovers, um, I guess, I guess we'd pay that price, but anyway, but that there is something in us that never changes. I'm irresistibly reminded of the fact that a film's faces and motions and settings have a double temporal existence as transient and as permanent. Every human being has his or her own, temp her own temperament, particular to that individual. But we have in common the mind's power, a power that is itself baffling to the mind, to, quote, raise a fact in our life from the web of our unconsciousness, as Emerson puts it in intellect, as if by illuminating it with the certain wandering light of a lantern, as if by as if by illuminating with a certain wandering light of a lantern, we transform it into a thought, a truth, an object impersonal and immortal. It is the past restored but embalmed. This is still Emerson. A better art than that of Egypt has taken fear and corruption out of it. Perhaps it shouldn't surprise us that the great film theorist and critic Andre Bazin, a century later, was to employ the identical metaphor in characterizing the film image. For the film projector is literally a lantern. Metaphorically, the camera is a lantern, too. In North by Northwest's art auction sequence, Roger Thornhill, the Cary Grant character, is so angry and hurt that he harps on his firsthand knowledge that Eve Kendall, even Marie Saint, throws her whole body into her job and deliberately arouses the jealousy of the villainous Van Damme, James Mason, placing Eve in dire jeopardy. But Roger is not Van Damme. The difference between them is revealed at the moment the professor, the CIA, whatever he is, uh, tells Roger that Eve is a double agent, and the camera moves in to a medium close-up. This shot conveys the anguish Grant's face expresses. Beyond this, the shot perfectly illustrates the point Emerson makes when he writes, the eye obeys exactly the action of the mind. When a thought strikes us, the eyes fix, 
and remain gazing at a distance. What's particularly striking here is the way the shot underscores that an intuition is dawning in Roger, a thought is being born by having a harsh light momentarily illuminate Grant's face. Within the world of the film, this light is cast by the headlights of a taxiing airplane. Metaphorically, it is the light, at times painful, at times blinding, of what Emerson calls the intellect. Had Hitchcock sought deliberately to illustrate Emerson's picture of the way the mind works, he couldn't have found a more perfect example. By framing Grant frontally as well as closely, Hitchcock not only enables the camera to capture the birth of Roger's thought, he designs the shot in such a way that it identifies the camera with the intellect. The shot at once captures Roger's mood, captures Roger's mood and inscribes his awakening to the knowledge that he must change. In inscribing Roger's thought, the shot also inscribes Hitchcock's thought, not only his thought about Roger, but also a thought about the camera, a thought that can be expressed precisely in Emerson's terms. It's the thought that the camera is a lantern whose certain wandering light has the power to raise a fact in our life from the web of our unconsciousness transforming it into a thought, a truth, an object, impersonal and immortal. Hitchcock's thought, I'd like to say, is that his art of pure cinema is a better art than that of Egypt. Hitchcock now dissolves to the Mount Rushmore monument, viewed from such a distance that the sculpted figures standing against the natural rock face are framed against the intense blue backdrop of the sky and the tops of tall evergreens in the foreground. The dissolve is so slow that for a lingering moment, Roger Cary Grant shares the screen with these American presidents chis chiseled permanently into the rock. Their human faces, once flesh and blood, but now carved in stone, quite literally raised into objects, impersonal and immortal. These monumental visages, rendered small by being superimposed over or perhaps under Grant's larger-than-life face, convey the impression that these American heroes are standing guard over Roger. It's as if they have his back, as we'd say it today. But it's also as if they're projections of Roger's imagination. At the moment, he has opened his eyes to the reality of his own wish to change to write his own future, to become a man of true character, a new American hero. By this dissolve, too, Hitchcock expresses a thought about Roger. And this thought about Roger is a thought about Cary Grant as well. Quote, a man is but a little thing in the midst of the objects of nature, Emerson observes. Yet by the moral quality radiating from his countenance, he may abolish all considerations of magnitude and in his manners equal the majesty of the world. This is the kind of individual that Roger wishes to become. It's the kind of individual Hitchcock's camera reveals Cary Grant on screen to be, even as the camera is declaring its own power to reveal this. Emerson describes such an individual when he writes, quote, I have seen an individual whose manners, though wholly within the conventions of elegant society, were never learned there, but were original and commanding. One who carried the holiday in his eye, calm, serious, and fit to stand the gaze of millions. Hitchcock now begins zooming the camera in At the same time, he narrows its field of vision, isolating the monument from its natural setting. Hmm. That was bound to happen. Yeah. By masking the frame with an iris 
as circular as the lens of a camera. He invokes this old-fashioned convention to imply retroactively that this shot had all along been from the point of view of someone looking through an optical device such as a telescope or a camera, the camera's viewfinder. When he now cuts to Grant, oh, I have to point it that way, in profile, looking through a telescope, this gesture implies a connection between Roger's view and the camera's. It's a textbook instance of what I call a declaration of the camera, one of Hitchcock's signature practices. These shots make evident that in thinking about Roger and about the great movie star who incarnates him, and in thinking more generally about myth and reality, artifice and nature, about heroism, about history, about America, that this sequence is also thinking about the camera, about the act of viewing, about the film medium, about the art of pure cinema, about change, about transience, about permanence, about the double temporal existence of the projected world. Um, okay. That's the first passage. And the second is from a chapter that's called Silence and Stasis. Until the last scene of Notorious, Alicia, Ingrid Bergman, and Devlin, Cary Grant again, are locked in a perverse pattern they're unable or unwilling to break. With scrupulous attention, Hitchcock's camera tracks the violence they do to each other and to themselves by their words and their silences. In the racetrack sequence, as Alicia is dutifully reporting to Devlin per her assignment, the impressions gleaned from her dinner with Sebastian and his fellow Nazis, Hitchcock frames their conversation. Oops. No. Hmm. There we go. Oops. frames their conversation in a shot that underscores that they're in a public place and have to appear as if they just happen to have run into each other and are simply chatting. But when Alicia says, you can add Sebastian's name to my list of playmates, she doesn't say it like that. She's, I can't begin to imitate the way Ingrid Bergman says that. <laughs> the camera registers and expresses the jump in emotional intensity of their conversation by cutting to a pair of shots that are closer and more intimate, but which also isolate Devlin and Alicia in separate frames. First, a shot of Devlin in which his expression hardening, he says, pretty fast work. Then a counter shot of Alicia. Just as she is beginning to speak the words, that's what you wanted, isn't it? She turns her head screen left. Uh, but because she performs this gesture, before we can grasp how this new camera angle relates spatially to the ones preceding it, we literally cannot tell whether Alicia is turning her head toward Devlin or away from him. Hitchcock composes this shot so that we experience it as spatially disorienting, I take it, so as to underscore both that this moment is meaningful and that its meaning as yet remains unknown, indeed unknowable by us. With her provocative words, Alicia reveals to Devlin for the first time her private understanding of his behavior in an earlier scene, her revelation of how she really thinks, although offered in a mode of attack, constitutes a significant development within a closed repetitive pattern that seemed to allow for no new developments. This revelation initiates a series of revelations by both parties, each a response to the preceding ones, 
a series that is not completed until the end of the film, when Devlin finally reveals to Alicia not only that he loves her, but that he had loved her from the beginning. The following close-up of Devlin, framed in profile, compounds our disorientation. Has he turned away from Alicia as she, perhaps, has turned away from him? Are we, perhaps, viewing him from her point of view? Or has only the camera changed position? On stage, an actress either does or does not turn away from an actor. And if an actor turns his profile to the audience, it is he who performs this gesture. The audience's position remains fixed. It is not merely that such ambiguities need the camera to capture them. Without the camera, they cannot be. Classical movies regularly employ a number of expressive postures and gestures, including but not limited to turning away from the camera, almost facing the camera, looking through the camera, meeting the camera's gaze, that in this way can only have reality. It's not merely that they can only be captured within the world of a film. Wounded by Devlin saying, you almost had me believing in that little miracle of yours. Lucky for both of us, I didn't. It wouldn't have been pretty if I believed in you. Alicia pretends to be looking through her field glasses. Visually, this is a moment of stasis. The film has stopped in its tracks, as it were. Actually, you can't see it in this frame. The only movement is the uh, reflection of horses running by, seen tiny in the you know, mirror of the, her field glasses lens. Still photographs, like paintings, cannot but be static, of course. But few still photographs convey the sense of time itself standing still. As this frame, or in, this frame enlargement must, if it's to evoke this moment of stasis within the film. If we're watching a DVD of Notorious and hit the pause button, we not only stop the film's motions, we also silence the film's voices. Frame enlargements on a page do not silence the film in the same way. The film has already been silenced. A frame enlargement invites the reader to pause for a moment to suspend his or her reading of the writer's words to contemplate the still image. At best, a frame enlargement can evoke a moment of a film, not enable a reader to experience it. Yet in that moment of contemplation, the writer's voice, or rather the reader's inner voice speaking the writer's words, when they're printed on the page, can they still be said to be the writer's words? fall silent. Or perhaps that voice has already achieved its own silence, has said all that the writer finds words to say about this moment of the film, so that the reader is already in the mood for the contemplation invited by the frame, which comes as if in response to a silent call. When reading resumes, the reader's inner voice breaks that silence then how can I provide evidence to back up my impression that at this moment of the film, Alicia does not wish for Devlin to finish his sentence, which he fears will wound her deeply. My sense that if she could make time stand still, she would. In any case, she cannot stop time in its tracks. The camera remains on Alicia, framing her closely as Devlin completes his thought if I'd figured. Alicia begins slowly lowering her field glasses or lets them fall of their own weight. She'd never be able to go through with it. She's been made over by love. That's Devlin's words. The mesmerizingly slow lowering of her field glasses unblocks Alicia's eyes from the camera's view, revealing them to be already downcast, 
to keep him from seeing the tears and the fire welling up in them. No frame enlargements can capture the mood or succession of moods conveyed here because Alicia's train of moods is expressed by movements within the frame, not by any static expression. Her face is anything but static. Her expressions, her expressions paint as many hues as any string of beans, beads Emerson could have seen or imagined. Within this unfolding shot, there seems an attunement, not a, not a conspiracy though, between Ingrid Bergman behaving as if she were Alicia and the camera that is a pre presence in the actress's world but an absence in the char character's world. It just seems to happen that when Alicia holds the field glasses to her face to hold, hide her eyes from Devlin's gaze, this woman's eyes are hidden from us as well. As it just seems to happen, that as the glasses lower, her eyes become unveiled from our view as well as from Devlin's. That these things do happen, however, has a profound traumatic impact on our experience of this shot and indeed the sequence and the film as a whole. Devlin's cruel words, for all their bitter sarcasm, belie his assertion that he had never believed in her. If he had never loved her, how could she have been made over by love? What Devlin is saying without saying it, what his silence is saying, is that he now knows that she is unworthy of love, but that he had once loved her. Just as she's on the verge of breaking her own silence, Alicia turns her face screen left. This time, her turning doesn't disorient us. She turns toward Devlin, not away from him, to speak the words, if you only once had said that you loved me. Her eyes no longer lowered. She speaks these words directly to him. In movies, the poetry, the lucidity of speech resides in the way just this person framed just this way, speaks just these words, in just this tone of voice, looking just this way, with just this expression, at just this moment, in just this situation, in just this setting. The camera's own gestures are performed, of course, in silence. I hear Alicia's line, as Ingrid Bergman hauntingly speaks it, as a sorrow sorrowful expression of a wish a wish she knows cannot come true, the wish that she could change the past, if only. Alicia has heard in Devlin's hurtful words an acknowledgement that he once had loved her. If he only once had said he loved her, she is saying without saying it, she would have acted differently and they would have been happy all this time. Would be happy now and would live happily ever after. Her words are also acknowledging something she had never admitted before, that her actions were no less responsible than his for leading them to this present impasse. At the same time, she is mindful as never before that the clock cannot be turned back, the past cannot be altered, the happy times they could have enjoyed together are forever lost. When Alicia whispers longingly and without visibly moving her lips, oh Dev, her eyes are again turned inward. Not that inward, that inward, okay. She seems to be speaking entirely from within her fantasy, to be speaking only to the man of her dreams, not to the man in his, her presence who is poised perhaps to strike a fatal blow by saying that he no longer loves her. I discern in Bergman's face both sadness and excitement. These are moods I'm prepared to attribute to Alicia on the basis of what I believe I see, what I believe anyone might see in Bergman's expression at this moment. Why is she sad? Because she cannot turn back the clock. Why excited? 
because she's looking forward to, even as she's dreading, what is about to happen. But sadness at time irretrievably lost, and excitement compounded of anticipation and dread of what is to come are not in the same way simply visible in this woman's face. They have to do with the way, for Alicia at this moment, the present is haunted by what might have been and by what might never come to be, both of which have no tangible reality and thus are out of reach, are they not, of Hitchcock's camera. Only when sounds fall silent do we become aware of the reality of silence, and only when motions run their course do we become aware of the reality of stillness, as if when most motion ceases, time itself is suspended, the way it is for Scotty at the end of Vertigo. For Scotty, no change is possible, no dawning of a new day, no future, no becoming. Alicia, too, at this moment finds herself suspended, but she is not beyond suspense the way Scotty is. She has not lost all hope for the future as he has. She has reason to believe now that Devlin had once loved her, and despite everything, she has not stopped loving him. In my book, The Eye of the Camera, I wrote that films, quote, speak to us in an intimate language of indirectness and silence. To speak seriously about a film, we must speak about that silence, its motivations and depths. We must speak about that to which the silence gives voice. We must give voice to that silence. We must, we must let that silence speak for itself. There may seem to be a conflict between the imperatives of giving voice to silence and letting the silence speak for itself. When we put into words what a film consigns to silence, do we not drown out the film's silence? The point, though, is that it is not one's words, but rather the silence they achieve when they reach the limits of what words can say, a silence within, within which the film's own silence reverberates that gives voice to that which the film consigns to silence. In writing about films, it's my experience that it's always possible to find words to evoke their moods of faces and motions and settings. This suggests that the border that separates words from film is also where the two touch. But it is when it reaches, it is when it reaches that border that film achieves its poetry. For writing about film to reach this border it must artfully evoke by its own voices and silences the poetry of film, the perception that every human gesture and posture, however glancing, has its lucidity. Such writing perceives film, the medium limited to surfaces, to the outer, the visible, to also be a medium of mysterious depths, a medium of the inner, the invisible. It has been a recurring theme in, of my own writing that many great films, Hitchcock certainly among them, meditate on the border, the barrier that is no real barrier that is the movie screen, and that they envision themselves as possessing the power to pass back and forth across that border, to overleap the wall. To borrow a, meta a metaphor Emerson invokes to characterize the power of thought. Is it any wonder then that writing like mine, which envis envisions itself as passing back and forth between giving voice to movies and finding my own voice in saying what I have to say about them, is drawn to films like Hitchcock's or to writing like Emerson's? Okay. Rothman, we have time for questions. If anyone in the audience has a question or a comment, please. 
sometimes yeah. takes a little bit before. There we go. I see. Yeah. Hi, thanks for your, uh, your reading and for your reading of the, of the films. Can you say a little bit more about Marnie? Because it seems, it seems that you take Marnie to be a kind of a, a unique achievement uh -huh. by Hitchcock, but also a kind of unique failure. Um, am I misunderstanding, or no. do those occur on different planes? Or? I, think they occur, I think it is a great achievement. It's, it's I don't know, the, the great critic Robin Wood said uh, that, what, if you don't, if, if you don't lo like Marnie, you don't really like Hitchcock. And beyond that, you know, if you don't like Marnie, you can't really love cinema, and <laughs> I, I, I can see, you know, I can see that. I would change it, as I say in my book, by saying if you don't love cinema, you can't love Marnie. Uh, you know, Marnie has been under, I don't know, its reputation is tarnished by two claims. One, that it's technically so behind the curve, it uses backdrops that don't look real. And uh, if, I don't know whether they look exactly real or not, but I, I understand, his cinematographer saw the footage and said, these don't look real. But, you know, I know how to fix it. And Hitchcock didn't want him to fix it. He didn't want, everything that happens in that last part of the film to feel simply real. So, but that's, you know, even if that was a failure of technique, there's a lot of quite new techniques that Hitchcock had never done before, including handheld cameras that, uh, that work beautifully in Marnie. So even if, you know, nobody's perfect, but the more damning charge is that the film has this uh, indefensible rape scene. And, you know, I, I argue it, I, I go through that sequence in close detail in the book and seriously call into question whether it can unprejudicially be called a rape or not. And uh, it's a difficult scene to swallow. But, you know, Hitchcock fired the original screenwriter who refused to write the scene the way Hitchcock wanted it. And he hired, uh, you know, a woman uh, who wrote, a, I think, a, a brilliant script. And she understood what, why this, this scene had to be this way. And not only do I think that the Sean Connery char character is not a monster, I, I think he's a real hero. You know, uh, most of Hitchcock's, you know, male protagonists are morally problematic figures. You know, when they're played by James Stewart, they're never uh, unambiguously redeemed hence the ending of Vertigo. When they're played by Cary Grant, they can have moments of awakening like that moment we looked at from North by Northwest. So he's capable of of awakening to his limitations and changing. And I think that the Sean Connery character is, is also, for Hitchcock, a real hero. And yeah, I defend him strongly in the chapter. Um, anyway, I, I think Marnie, when you really get to know it, it, is a deeply moving film, and moving in ways that uh, you know was a were brave new. I don't call them experiments. Uh, they were brave new steps for Hitchcock in the direction that I argue in my book is 
in the direction of what Emerson would call uh, the uh, walking toward the unattained but attainable self. And, you know, it has a, an emotionally complex ending, but it's a, an ending which allows unambiguously for hope that the change that it's not Mark brought about in Marnie, he helped, but the crucial steps had to have been taken and were taken by Marnie herself. So, you know, she changes. She lets an old self die, Emerson metaphor, and a, a new self is born. And the Sean Connery character plays, a, 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 for all of his flaws, he plays a uh, unambiguously positive role in the growth of Marnie's character. And in the end, you know, not everybody, it's not a rosy picture, because Marnie's mother remains at the end as incapable of expressing her love as she had always been. There's no hope for her. But, you know, the, the last, but Hitchcock gives us the last shot of Marnie's mother alone, finishing a sentence as Marnie and her husband leave. They promise to come back. Uh, she, calls, she calls Marnie sugar pop. In a tone of voice, we know she had never let her daughter hear. So, you know, we know that uh, her love is real. And it's a, it's a human tragedy when, for whatever reasons, uh, love that is real goes unacknowledged, unexpressed. And so, you know, there's a directness of emotional expression the birds goes halfway there. You know, the, the, uh, also the mother, this time the, the, ma the man's mother, played by the great Jessica Tandy. Uh, you know, if, she, if, if this weren't Jessica Tandy, she would be a bitch, she would be a monster mother, but she's not. We understand the depth of her feeling. We understand her sense of being trapped. We're, and it, but Marnie goes even further and, uh, and allows its romantic couple to overcome the obstacles, not external to their relationship, internal to their relationship, that, uh, that w apart, you know, without overcoming uh, those obstacles, they could be legally married, they could be married in the eyes of the church, but they wouldn't have a real marriage. It wouldn't be a relationship worth having. The kind of marriage that the couples achieve in the great Hollywood romantic comedies of the 1930s and 1940s. So, yeah, I, I think Marnie is an incredibly brave film for Hitchcock to make, you know, late in his career. He takes a huge risk. Artistically, I think it pays off. Uh, but, you know, it takes a lot of money to make a film. And uh, he had a contract with Universal saying, as long as the film doesn't cost more than, I think, $7 million, he can make any film he chooses, with the exception of Mary Rose, which is the film Hitchcock wanted to make based on a play by uh, the guy who wrote uh, Peter Pan, a play Hitchcock had seen in London in 1920. Uh, that would have been a great, and he commissioned the uh, screenwriter uh, of Marnie to write a screenplay. It's a, it's a beautiful screenplay. But, you know, not, he just, he didn't make it. and. And the films, the last few films he made all have their points. If anybody else had made them, they, they would be things to be proud of, but they didn't. 
represent for Hitchcock a, a further step in the direction of the unattained but attainable self. But, but you know, the, the key, the, there are all these long dialogues, huge amount of conversation between Mark and Marnie. And if you don't have an ax to grind against the Sean Connery character, they're fantastic, brilliantly written, uh, brilliantly filmed, and Tippi Hedren holds her own with Sean Connery, which is no easy matter because, you know, I don't know, maybe he'll become the first president of Scotland. I don't know. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's a great star and he's fantastic and she holds her own and gets more than her share of the best lines. So, I, yeah, I, I, I love Marnie. But it took me a long time to realize how great I think now it is. Up here? Uh, up here in the front row? Go ahead. Yeah. I have a question. Um, Alfred Hitchcock's made, I'm not sure how many films he made, but a huge amount of movies, including silent films. Yeah. And um, do you know if this um, Emersonian influence kind of lasts from the beginning to the end of his career? Well, see, what I think is, he, I, I don't know whether he read any Emerson, although, at, you know, somebody, the whole world was reading Emerson, you know, at a certain point. So he probably did, but it, it's American movie. You know, what I argue in the book, and it's a view that was really first stated by my old mentor, Stanley Cavell, that what it is that allowed Hollywood movies, especially in the 1930s, to be at the same time extremely popular and extremely serious was that they inherited the outlook of, you know, American transcendentalism, Emerson, his great disciple Thoreau, his more recent great disciple uh, Bob Dylan, although that was a little bit too late. And uh, so, you know, when Hollywood's survival was threatened by the Great Depression and by the threat that the, that the Catholic Legion of Decency and other entities would, would boycott Hollywood movies, which would drive them out of business. You know, Hollywood uh, adopted this, uh, it had already, the production code had already been written, but it agreed to censor itself very strictly, which meant that its ways of trying to attract audiences in the early 30s by uh, becoming increasingly violent and increasingly sexy, uh, th they couldn't do that anymore. So they had to find a different way. And, you know, and Cavell's argument is it happened one night, which was a low budget film by a small studio. Nobody expected it to be a big deal, but it swept the Academy Awards and it gave Hollywood the solution, which was find stories to tell and ways of telling that story, those stories that tap into the spirit of, call it the New Deal, you know, which was, I like to say, in the ascendancy in Hollywood uh, from that point until the end of the 1930s. So when a film like The 39 Steps in 1935, in some respects, it's no different from Hitchcock's earlier films, even his silent films. The difference is that it conceives of the romantic relationship between Hannay, played by the great Robert Donut, and uh, Madeline Carroll, uh, conceives of it as very much in the mode of the relationship of the couple in It Happened One Night and, and subsequent Hollywood romantic comedies, uh, of which maybe the greatest is the Philadelphia story. 
uh, you know, a kind of relationship that has roots in Shakespeare's comedies and late romances. So, you know, what's clear, I think, is the influence of Hollywood, of that vision that rejuvenated Hollywood in the 1930s. That, you know, Hitchcock was, was it's not just he thought this could help him, his career, he was really drawn to it. But his artistic identity was already identified with a genre called the Hitchcock thriller, which revolves around murder. There's a murderous villain. And the author is a figure uh, closely uh, linked to the villain. So, you know, for Hitchcock's artistic identity is inseparable from the idea that the camera is, as it were, inherently an instrument of villainy. So how can that idea, which is the idea that we, you know, it, it's what lies behind the Oscar Wilde quote, each man kills the thing he loves. How can that idea be reconciled with the, that Emersonian moral outlook that, that made Hollywood movies of that period well, it reached their artistic high water mark? And that's why I say, you know, it was the driving force because Hitchcock, kept, you know, he couldn't abandon himself to either of these views. Uh, but they were incompatible. So there's this conflict or tension. And as I say in my book, I could trace the vicissitudes of that tension and conflict within his work, but also discern that in the long run it moves in a particular direction. And, um, you know, Marnie, in the understanding I outlined in my book, is the ultimate achievement. But yeah, it's, it's, it wasn't our, an artistic failure, but it was not something the critics or the audience in 1964 were prepared for. It's not that they wanted Hitchcock to make films that out-psychoed Psycho. And, uh, you know, even the birds, does, you know, the, the bir there's no real attack by the birds until maybe 45 minutes have gone by in that film. So, or, and I remember, when, you know, I was, when I, s I wanted, when those films came out, I wanted the birds to out Psycho Psycho. And I wanted, you know, it's, I wanted Tippi Hedren to, there's no way to out Grace Kelly, Grace Kelly, but I wanted her to be another Grace Kelly, and she's not. And, uh, and then when Hitchcock used her again in Marnie, I thought she was awful. I, th I thought, uh, you know, I still liked some things. Of, you know, age has its uh, advantages as well as disadvantages. <laughs> I'm now wise enough to uh, understand not only understand what I didn't understand before, but even why the certain person who didn't understand those things is the person who now understands them. So in my book, I give a reading of Vertigo that uh, up to a point follows the thinking in an earlier essay of mine about Vertigo, but it departs radically with it and I have to, and I have to understand this is my training as a certain kind of philosopher both I, I had I have to as a critic I feel I have to not just spell out this new way of understanding vertigo so that the reader can check it against his or her own experience but I also feel I have to account for uh, what is it about the film and what is it 
about me that uh, made it possible for me not to see what now I can see so clearly. And, uh, and, so, and that becomes an integral part of my reading of, uh, re reading of the film. It wasn't just, I wasn't the only one who didn't see it. Nobody had seen it. And yet, there's no film that more, I mean, more serious criticism has been written about Vertigo than just about any other film. And a clue, I won't tell you because you have to read the book, but a clue is it has to do with the role of the woman. Uh, how knowing or how oblivious we believe she is. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rosen. Okay. I'll mute that for you. Don't worry about that. I'll mute that. Okay. All right, so just a reminder for our internet audience watching at home, there's still time to call the number on your screen. You can purchase a copy of tonight's book. We'll have Dr. Rothman sign it for you, and we'll ship it to wherever you are in the U.S. free of charge. Also a reminder that all of our live streamed events are archived. So if you don't get to watch it live, you can go to the Books and Books website, go to the live streaming link, and all of the presentations will be saved there for you to watch at your convenience. For those of you here in the house, we have Must We Kill the Thing We Love? as well as Hitchcock, The Murderous Gaze, and other titles by Dr. Rothman for sale at the counter over there. He's going to be signing over there at the table to the left of the screen. And uh, uh, Dr. Rothman, it's always fascinating when you come and speak here. Please, can we give him another hand? Thanks very much.